In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you for your kindness, your mercy, your blessings, for your calling us to yourself in your house. I thank you for the invitation and the warm welcome and for the great things you've nourished us with. I thank you, dear Lord, for always meeting us here and gathering your children. We come to you, dear Lord, with great needs, and our need is for you to have more of you in our lives. I pray, dear Lord, that you would fill us, that you would enrich us, help us, O Lord, to have holy and sanctified minds, souls, bodies, and spirits. Bless the words today and bless your people here. I pray, dear Lord, to give each one according to his needs. The intercession of your beloved mother, St. Mary, and all your saints, and the witnesses of the Holy Transfiguration, hear us when we, your children, say unto you with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. We are continuing our series on treasures of Orthodox spirituality. We just want to get a basic understanding of some of the characteristics of our spirituality that have been handed down to us from the beginning. And when I say from the beginning, uh, I was just uh, attending a men's meeting in another church this week, and they were reading a document from the first century, the Didache. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But it's written probably between 60 A.D. to like the very beginning of the second century. One of the things that was mentioned, it was one of the things that they did from the very beginning, was fast Wednesdays and Fridays from the very first century of the church. So the things that we're doing, we didn't just come up and try to make them spiritual. It's kind of what was there, a lot of it, from the absolute beginning. So this is what was handed down to us. Uh, last few weeks, Father David spent some time speaking about the sacraments. Hopefully you understood that the sacraments give us power, that we receive something from them. They're not just something that you have to attend. They're what actually supply your spiritual life. You know, when I think about something like the Eucharist, when I think of people like Pope Kurlos, Abuna Shoy Kamel, Abuna Mahil Ibrahim, like these spiritual giants, they tried to have communion every single day. So those giants, what was their source of power? It was communion. And why we're not embracing it like they are is something that we need to maybe start reconsidering. It's not just something I attend and I have to go to so I don't get in trouble. You come here to find God's grace and power. I wanted to start off with a few of the concepts that are just kind of the basics of our spirituality so that that way when you understand these foundations, some of it will make sense on, so this idea, when you talk to people nowadays, do you go to a church? No, I'm just spiritual. Well, what does spiritual mean? Right now, it could mean anything. It means you could believe in a higher power. It means that you have emotions when you hear music. It could mean you have a connection with your cat. Like, spiritual means different things to all kinds of people. What does spiritual mean? What does spirituality mean in our church? It's the way we experience union with God in the Holy Spirit by which our flesh is made spiritual. It's the way that we experience God, like through the Holy Spirit, it's the way we become spiritual. We're transformed spiritually. Another way is being spiritual is being filled by the Holy Spirit. It's being filled by the Holy Spirit. That's what spiritual means. It has nothing to do with cats. Sorry, for those of you cat lovers. Um, and so let me go back briefly. What is the purpose that God created us? He created us in what way? In Genesis 1, it says he created us in his what? In his, in his image and likeness. So when he created us, he created us imperfect. We were not perfect. Adam was not perfect. But God gave him the potential to become perfect not being all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, but perfect in 
his behavior. Obviously, Adam kind of messed it up. I'm not going to say whose fault it was, but Adam and Eve both fell. And that messed it up for the rest of mankind. When Christ came back, his goal was to restore us to that first state, which we say in the Gregorian liturgy. He, just, he came that he would renew us and restore us to the very first state of being like Adam and Eve, where they had the potential to be perfect. That's our goal. Christ's salvation wasn't just so that you go to heaven to restore us to the original state of being like Adam and Eve in paradise with the potential of the image and likeness of God to be like him. So when you think about what we're doing spiritually, that's our goal is to go back to that original state. And then Christ told the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Many of us are slightly short of that, being perfect, but at least it gives us something to aim for. And I don't know how many of us are aiming to be perfect, not that you are going to be just this awesome person, but that you are aiming to be holy as God is holy. So one of the foundations of all our understanding and our purpose in Orthodox Christianity is this idea of theosis. I know that was a word that was sometimes considered controversial, but you know who developed it? St. Athanasius, St. Cyril, St. Basil, like St. Gregory <coughs> Nazianzus, and later St. Gregory Palamas. This idea of, it says, we say this in our Tezbaha uh, during Kiyak, God became man so that man could become like God, okay? So he took what was ours and gave us what belongs to him. So he gave us this potential. This is the actual foundation of all our spirituality. We are trying to become like God, not on our own. It's what God shares. So I'm going to break it down really quick. I, I'm not trying to get too theological. But God has his essence and his energies. And a good example is the sun. So there's the ball of gas up there, the sun, the actual planet. But most of us don't experience the actual sun. We'd probably die. But what we do experience is the heat and the rays. Those are the energies of the sun. We don't experience the actual essence, but we experience the energies. And we are experiencing the sun through the energies. Same thing with how we experience God. We're not experiencing like becoming one with his omniscience and omnipresence and all power. We're becoming one with his energies, like his grace, his love, his compassion, his forgiveness, all these things. Those are the things in how we be to become united with God. And so sometimes God gives us, and they give the example of what we see in the reflection of water. Sometimes you see the sun reflecting on the water, and that's your experience of the sun because you can't look directly at the sun. God gives it to us in these ways which we're able to accept it and now we know what it's like and that's what we're aiming for. Okay. There's a verse that's kind of the essence of this concept of theosis and it's in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. And it's actually an amazing verse. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need. His energies have been given to us for life and godliness. He's been given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his great and precious promises, meaning through that divine power, he's given us his promises so that through them you may do what? Participate in the divine nature. In some translations, partake of the divine nature nature. We participate in God's nature, not his essence, but in his energies. And there's a lot of people that are kind of ignoring this verse, but this is what we as Orthodox depend on. God is sharing his energies with us through his Holy Spirit, and that's what transforms us to be like him. So I just have a few quotes that you might have heard and hopefully remember, but when I was talking in the summer about the Holy Spirit, St. Seraphim said one of the goals of the Christian life is to acquire the Holy Spirit. 
Like this was like the highest thing because the Holy Spirit is how we experience the energies of God. Saint Theophan is one of my favorite saints. Uh, he says, this is the essence of the spiritual life. The life in Christ consists in the transformation of soul and body and the transformation into the sphere of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, spiritualizing the soul and the body. So the reason why I'm kind of saying all this stuff, I'm not trying to say big words. Many a times we think the goal is to pray the Igbeya or to attend a liturgy or to read a Bible and have quiet time. That's not the goal. The essence of the life is this transformation. And many of us have been doing the same things over and over daily or maybe not so daily for years and there's no transformation. We're missing out. The whole point is not to do the practice. The whole point is to become united like Christ. That needs to be your, like, on your mirror every day. For those of you who are very humble and monk-like, put it wherever you pray, you know. But, like, it needs to be something that you see, like, my goal is to be like Christ. So, one of the things that is uh, inherent in this concept of theosis, where we become like God, is this concept of synergy. Do you guys know what synergy means? What is synergy? It's like oneness. It's where two things are working together. And the sum of the two parts is greater than each individual. Like when they're united, they do something amazing. So synergy means we need to work with God for our salvation. Some people have different concepts and misconceptions. There are some people who say, God does everything. You don't do anything. God did everything for your salvation, and you didn't do anything. We don't see it like that. But then there's some people who say, you have to earn your salvation, and you got to go and try and work and be holy and do all these things, and then you're going to get saved. That's not our understanding either. God's role and our role are both necessary, but they are not equal. His is infinitely greater than ours, but God will not force his salvation on anyone. Your voluntary participation is absolutely necessary. And when you understand this, for those who are trying to earn it on your own, you are never in a million years going to get there. Nothing you will ever do will get you into heaven on your own. You need God. But God will not force it on you. So you have to work with Him. The purpose of this should put in my mind, I need God for my salvation. I haven't earned it. It's not my doing. Yeah. And so synergy is extremely important. We're both involved in our salvation. St. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's a role. You have to accept it and work with God. What this does is it creates in you humility because you're not it. God does the majority of it. And it creates in you faith because you realize, I need him to do anything. And if you look at all the spiritual problems in your have, that you have in your life, many of us are saying, I can do this. I'll just do a few new practices. No. Without the grace of God, you can do nothing. But the Bible says, with God, what is possible? All things. So, you might be in a spiritual state right now. You're like, I am so far from God, there's no hope. Wrong. With God, anyone can be changed. But without God, I don't care who you go to, talk to, try. It's not going to happen. It requires God's grace. And so you have to work together for your salvation. Okay. So we talk about becoming Christ-like, but one more part of our spirituality I want you to understand St. John Chrysostom says the church is a hospital. It's not a courtroom where we're here to be acquitted of our sins, but it's a hospital where people get treated. We are wounded by sin. So he says that the church is a hospital that cures people who are wounded by sin, and the bishops, the priests, are the therapists of the people of God. Many people come to the church and they expect to see saints. Besides on the wall, they like to see them 
among us. And they're here. They're not visible to all of us. But in the end, when you go to a hospital, you don't, like to, you don't go to see all the Olympic athletes there. You see all the sick people there. They're going there to be healed. So I want you to understand that a lot of our spirituality focuses on healing our spiritual illnesses. Even Christ's redemption. What was the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. Sin is an illness that leads to death. So when Christ came and died for us, what did he do? Let's read it. In Isaiah 53, when you read about the cross, that amazing chapter, if you read about it, it talks about all that he went through. He was wounded, just like we were wounded by our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. It didn't say we are forgiven. We are healed. We are made whole. I think a lot of time we look at the sins in our life as, I need to go get this forgiven. So we go, we confess it, and it's forgiven. But what we haven't gotten was a cure for our disease. And oftentimes we want the symptoms treated. If a person has cancer and their abdomen is filling with fluid, their lungs are filling with fluid, or they're jaundiced. If they're jaundiced, we can, you know what, you know, get like yellow makeup and blend it in, or we can like remove the water from your abdomen and your chest. And guess what? That symptom is removed. But guess what? You're not healed. The disease has not been dealt with. And so what we are taught is that all that the church is giving us is for healing our spiritual diseases. Don't look at it as like, I have a sin. I need to get rid of it. I'm sick. I'm wounded. I need life. I need healing. Which is why we need to go to our spiritual therapists, our spiritual guides. And I asked you three weeks ago, did you find a spiritual guide yet? You need to find a spiritual guide. You're not going to be able to just walk into a hospital and know all the medicines and know how to take them. They're not all going to fit. They don't all work the same way for everyone. You need it tailored for you. I cannot emphasize enough the need of a spiritual guide who will take you step by step. One of the things that you're going to see, what is probably the most common thing you hear in the liturgy? Most common thing. Lord, have mercy. That Lord, have mercy, we say it over and over and over. And some people say we're saying it too much. But do you understand where it comes from and what it means? So the word mercy comes from the Greek word ileos. So like in, sometimes we say eleisonimes. Ileos, it comes from that word. And that word is the same word for olive oil. In those days, what was the olive oil used for? It was poured onto wounds, and it was gently massaged. It was soothing, and it was comforting. It made the injury better and whole. Same thing in, in the Hebrew, the word is hesed. And it means steadfast love. So now, when we say Lord have mercy with the meaning in the Hebrew and in the Greek, what is it saying? Lord, soothe me and my wounds. Comfort me. Heal me. Take away my pain. Show me your love. It's not saying just don't let lightning strike me. It's I'm sick. I have a need of healing. Come and be my healer. And so when you realize that it's heal me, heal all my spiritual diseases, I want to say it every moment of the day because I need it. And so it's not something that we say too much. So then hopefully you understand now that all that the church gives us is for healing. The liturgy and the power of the liturgy is for healing spiritual illnesses. Confession and the time you spend with your spiritual guide is not for forgiveness only, but it's hopefully to 
give you the therapies you need to heal the illness. Don't get rid of the symptoms only, but to heal the illness. So you want to lower it? Okay. So not only are the sacraments for healing Okay. Not a single burden that needs to be forgiven and healed. Acts of charity, like our priests might say, I realize that you have a bit of selfishness, you have a bit of greed, that you are very interested in earthly things. I need you to do more acts of charity. He's not saying just forgive you. <clears throat> I need to heal this part where you're focusing on you. Fasting. Helps us to overcome what? Clothes that are too tight. No. It, it helps us to overcome, obviously, the lust and the desires of the flesh, which are the sources of most of our passions. Watchfulness. What is watchfulness? What is watchfulness? Being vigilant, being alert. You want to know what that is? That's preventative medicine. That's the type of medicine that prevents you from catching certain illnesses. Again, when you look at now, my spirituality is like, I'm not just going to say prayers and read the Bible, but I have spiritual diseases, and I need these specific ones to be healed. The Bible is healing. The liturgy is healing. Confession is healing. And your spiritual guide hopefully will find the right therapy for you. And then, I don't know if you recall, but earlier this year, we did a series on the heart. And most of our spirituality comes from the heart. And almost all that we talk about, but ultimately, the fathers look at all the ailments of the heart, all the treatments of the heart, not just the flesh. Because if the heart is made whole, then the flesh becomes made well. But if the heart is bad, everything falls apart. Everything, the mind, the soul, the spirit, everyone is tarnished when the heart is not made. So we tend to focus on the heart as the center of our spirituality. So one of the other things about Orthodox spirituality is built on the experiences of those who have known God. I love that. I'm going to... Well, I have I have them at the end, but it's based on people who have had such. It's not just like they read something and then they're teaching it. And the biggest thing about Orthodox spirituality is it's not meant to be intellectual. And sometimes we get confused. It's not meant to be intellectual at all. During the Age of Enlightenment, that became kind of the thought in the West. 
where they had to rationalize God and they had to come up with all these theories of how to explain God exists and that really wasn't our issue. Our issue was your responsibility is to experience God, not to philosophize about him. St. Simeon, the new theologian, he has this amazing quote. It's like one of my favorite quotes. He says, every Christian should be confident of the spirit of God inside of them just as a pregnant woman is assured of a baby inside of her. How? She can feel. She can experience. She knows. Like, I can't. A woman is gaining a little bit of weight. She's getting a little bit round in the middle. I'm like, I think you're just putting on, you need to lay off the Oreos. Like, you just need to, and she's like, no, there's a baby. In. I'm like, I, no, I don't, and she's like, I don't think there's a baby. No, she's like, I know there's a baby. There's no way you could convince me that there's not a baby inside. I experience it. That's actually what Orthodox spirituality is supposed to be. It's personal experience. It's not theories. It's not sermons. It's not knowledge. It's you and God becoming one. And I think a lot of time, and this is what is sad, and, you know, I think especially for kids, but a lot of time they don't see the experience part. And even oftentimes for us, we do the outward part, but we're missing the true experience with God the Almighty. Like Moses, God, he wanted to see God. God couldn't show him all of him, so what did he do? He says, I'm going to pass by and you're going to see my glory. I could imagine he could have written volumes of just that one moment. Should we experience that same glory in our lives? Someone will say, I don't believe in your Christian God. I'm like, I can tell you so much about him. There's no way. And if you're going to kill me, kill me. But I'm not going to stop talking to you about what I've seen and experienced in my own life. We need to have that experience. And if we don't have that experience, find a guide who can help you. You've been baptized. You've received the Holy Spirit. The energies of God are near to you and available to you. You have all the means of knowing him personally. But I have to emphasize, this is one of the things that we don't like. Orthodox spirituality has a lot of ascesis, asceticism. Do you know what ascesis means or asceticism? What does it mean? What does it mean? It's almost like jihad, right? Or jihad. It is. It's the same word, right? What does it mean? It means struggle. It means struggle. And if you read, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the Orthodox spiritual, we struggle, <laughs> right? We force you to struggle. We push you to struggle. And this is the part that most of us complain about. Most of us don't want to struggle. And I love going to the gym and going, looking at the lightest weights. And I just go there and I just look good. And I, I try, I don't sweat. My muscles, they don't change. Like, I'm just going for the easiest thing, and I'm happy. I'm like, I went to the gym. It's not most why most people go. That's why I go. But um, So it's the same thing with Christianity. Christ never said, come, follow me. You're going to have ease and comfort for the rest of your life. What did he say? Come, follow me. No, no, no. He says, come. What did he say? Deny yourself. Fall, no. Come, deny yourself, and... Take your cross and follow me. Nowhere did he say, I'm going to give you ease and comfort on, on this earth. He says, in the world you're going to have tribulation. That's it. The Bible says, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violence do what? They take it by force. Not like easy, like, ah, oh, I'm just going to stroll into the kingdom of God, and there's like a very broad way. And I'm just going to go that way. It's nice and easy. And that's not the way we tend to practice. Because Satan loves our lazy days. He loves our days where we're just like, ah, everything is good, just relaxing. Those are the days where he loves to attack. So what do we do? We struggle. We fight. We keep our minds. We tend to fast. We tend to do all kinds of things. And it has to be with struggle. If you're not willing to struggle... Christ never, all the people said, they said, I want to follow you. He says, you know, I don't have a place to lay my head. Like, he never said, like, if you want to be a real Christian, know that there will be struggle. 
In majority of the world, if I were to take you to the Armenian Christians in northern Syria right now, who are being attacked by the Turkish who were invaded last week, they're like, this Christianity is not easy. If I take you to Iraq or I take you to Nigeria or I take you to all these places, like a lot of the places in the world, Christianity is not easy. And they are struggling to stay Christian. Are we struggling to stay Christian? Maybe because of temptations, but not because of like threats of violence. We need ascesis. We need struggle. And you need to embrace it. You just have to embrace it. That's what Christianity is. And I'll tell you what, your life is like a vapor. That's what the Bible tells us, right? What is a vapor? If you were to lift up your cup of coffee, a little steam comes up and it goes away. You're like, that was quick. Can I see it? No, it's gone. It's gone. That's what our life on earth is. If you think you can just suffer for the time of your vapor so that you could experience eternity, wow. So we're willing to accept the struggle because that's how we fight our passions. You know, there's a concept called dispassion. One of the things we'll talk about eventually. You know what dispassion is? What what is a passion? Let's talk about what a passion is. It's a natural desire that goes out of control, right? You have a desire to eat. You have a need to eat. You're supposed to eat occasionally. Please, do. But when you want to eat all the time, then it becomes gluttony. For procreation, there's a desire for sexual pleasures for procreation. It's a gift that God has given us, but there are those who desire it more than they need to. It's way too much. It consumes them, and then they become changed. Same thing with money. Well, what is dispassion? Where those things don't move you. There's a huge feast at somebody's house. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. Like, There's tons of money. You have an opportunity <coughs> to sacrifice family and this and that <coughs> for tons of money. like, I'm not going to let that take, I don't care. It doesn't move me. I'm not saying don't care about money. You probably all need money. Don't care about, you need to eat, you need, but there's moderate, but then there's a higher level where those things don't move you. I'm getting to the end here. We're going to have to fight the flesh. Then the last couple of points are this. Spiritual warfare is something we need to be experts at. My favorite books growing up, like when I was a teenager, were the books about spiritual warfare. The things that you learn in spiritual warfare, they really do help you become closer to God. One of my, the quotes I remember, there was a monk who said, Since I've been in the desert, I've fallen into many sins, but never the same sin twice. He had been in the desert for years. That's spiritual warfare. He understood the attack of the enemy. He understood his weakness. He understood where the traps are, and he became better. You know that whole concept, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. He's like, I'm not going to be fooled. Satan can get anyone to fall once, but are we ever going to become willing to fight back and not, what if you stopped falling in the same sins that are bothering you what if you never fell in those ever again how would you be what would you be like like christ more like christ it's kind of what we need it's kind of what we want then i'm going to just talk about the experience of the fathers and this is Unbelievable. I, so people on Facebook are awesome. It's certain, you know, you go, I think it's called Orthodox Church Fathers. They put these pictures of the saint and like a quote, and I just save them. Just save them. I have a bunch of them saved to my phone. They're amazing. So this is one man's experience, someone called St. Macarius the Great, who's great for a reason. The enjoyment of God is insatiable. What does that mean? Insatiable. Unquenchable. Like the... Enjoyment of God is unquenchable. Once you enjoy him, you can't stop. The more anyone tastes and eats of him, the more he hungers. Such men's ardor and passion for God is beyond restraint. And the more they endeavor to get on 
and make progress, the more they esteem themselves poor as those that are in need and have nothing. This is the sign of Christianity. This is humility. What I like about the fathers is this. I read the Bible. This passage is not in the Bible, but I find it very useful because it explains things to me about the Bible when it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Here's someone who took it so much further. There's a verse that says, pray unceasingly. But then St. John Chrysostom says, everywhere, wherever you find yourself, you can set up an altar to God in your mind by means of prayer. Like wherever you are, you could pray. It's like, yeah, I never really thought of that. I don't get that when I do my own readings. When I read the Fathers, everyone loves Pope Carlos, so let's, I mean, who doesn't want to know what Pope Carlos thought? Who doesn't want to have conversations with him and hear what he said? Through prayer, your mind will be enlightened, your heart will be healed, and your conscience purified. Through prayer, you will grow in virtue and grace. Through prayer, your heart will be filled with holy and divine desires, which is opposite of lust, will be elevated above human nature. Through prayer, you will be raised above earthly things. All your desires will be transformed into spiritual ones. The armies of the enemy are too many to fight alone, so you will never defeat them by yourself. I want to hear what Pope Carlos has to say. I want to hear what all these saints who reached the highest levels, who understood the Bible, why not read them? And that is a huge part of Orthodox spirituality. So this is just a quick summary. Uh, this book, which we kind of did a series on a couple of years ago, The Philokalia for the Layperson, this is just like the beginning of one chapter, just one picture. I'm just going to read it. Some of the things that are very important in our spirituality, and this is how he talks about fighting the passions, but this is how you do it. Prayer, especially the Jesus prayer, which I mentioned over and over. We have to learn. Eventually, we're going to do a talk on the Jesus prayer. Remembrance of the name of Jesus. Just remembering God throughout your day puts you in the presence. The idea of constantly trying to be in the presence of God. A lot of time, our spiritualities are, I read my Bible in the morning, I prayed my bag at night, and that's when I thought of God. But the idea of praying and remembering God all day. Remembrance of the Lord's passion. Thinking about his crucifixion will make you less grumpy. You'll complain less. You'll accept your own sufferings a lot more when you look at Christ's sufferings. That gives so many, like, okay, Christ died on the cross. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was pierced. And I have the choice to stand up for the Agbeya. Like, when you start to think about his passions, what he went through, his passion, not his passions, then all of a sudden you might be encouraged that he did that for you. What can I do for him? Remembrance of the last judgment and death. This is the father's talk. St. Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians, I die daily. Some of the fathers say, I die twice daily. Meaning I die in the morning and I die at night. Meaning what? I remember in the morning that I'm going to die and I'm going to face judgment. So that my behavior throughout the day would be changed. At night, I think about all the things I've done through the day. And I begin to repent and beg God for mercy. If you are doing this, they say this is what leads to people to stop sinning. If you think about God's judgment and your last day. If you knew that today was your last day, I'm praying that it's not. But what if it was? Like, what if I said, tomorrow, tomorrow we're all going to go to heaven? What would you do today? Don't talk to me. I'm going to be in my room crying, <laughs> repenting. Like, I'll, hopefully I'll see you in heaven. Right? That's what, so now you know if... Does anyone know their last day? Oh, okay. If you do, great. But if you know your last day, that's because you're already there. God has told you when you're going. But for those of us who don't, we need to do this. Finally, don't feed the passions but starve them, be watchful, wage war against the passions through ascesis, putting on the armor of God through the reading of God's word, writings of the church fathers, through the sacraments, especially confession and the Eucharist. This is like a quick taste of Orthodox spirituality. Next week, we're going to talk about the Igbeya. I know it's one of those topics that everyone wants to hide under the table. You're going to go to Starbucks and stay as long as you can. 
But please, bring your Agbeyas, the one that you use at home, your paperback one. Um, if you like the digital one, that's fine. And let's just talk about how this is all in the Igbeya. It's given to you in a book. You read it, you meditate on it, and this can take you to the highest levels. Okay? I pray that this week will be a week of fighting the passions and remembrance of God and trying to draw closer to Him. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My dear Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, we thank you, dear Lord, for the graces that you've poured upon us. I thank you, dear Lord, for your redemptive work of desiring to heal us and to give us life. I thank you, dear Lord, for desiring to pour yourself into us. I thank you, dear Lord, that even though we might at times appear as lepers, you didn't draw away from us because of our many sins, but yet you draw near to us because your desire to heal us and make us whole. Dear Lord, so many of us, including myself, are struggling spiritually. We have these illnesses that we are begging you, dear Lord, have mercy. Soothe our wounds and make our illnesses go away. Help us, O Lord, to be more than conquerors. Help us, O Lord, to be victorious. Help us, O Lord, to say that there will be nothing that will separate us from you. I pray, dear Lord, that you would lead us on the path of humility. Help us, O Lord, to withdraw from ourselves and the things that are earthly. And help us, O Lord, to realize our great dependence on you every moment. I pray, dear Lord, that you would guide each and every one of us throughout this day, step by step, every word that we say and everything that we see, every place that we go. Help us, O Lord, to realize that everything depends on you. We draw close to you, dear Lord, and pray that you would receive us, accept us, Bless us by your spirit. The work that you have started, may it be completed in each and every one of us according to your great will. Help our children and us, dear Lord, to have a true personal experience of you. I ask all this through your precious and amazing name, our Lord Jesus Christ, through the session of St. Mary, and all the beloved saints who have shown us the path from the beginning. Hear us when we, your children, say with all intention and concentration, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.